Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the first uh, Coffee Microcaps uh, monthly manager call, where we run through two stocks from a particular fund manager from their choosing. We're not going to focus too much on latest results or valuations, more around their investment thesis or why they're holding some of the key risks, uh, some of the key profit drivers, uh, the, the outlook for the stock, and really just get a sense of the business uh, and, where, and where it's going and, and why the particular manager has it in their portfolio. So for our first installment of this series, I'd like to welcome Mr. Dave McNamee from Altor Capital. Dave, how are you? Good. How are you, Mark? Good. And the two stocks we're going to tackle today is um, XTEC, X-T-E, and uh, Swick Mining, S-W-K. And uh, let's, let's kick off with uh, XTEC. And I think, yeah, maybe the, the first question is uh, maybe just give us an overview of the business, you know, what they do, how they make their money. Yeah, sure. So uh, XTEC has traditionally been a reseller of defense items. So that they, they sell um, sort of explosive ordinative devices, EODs, um, ammunition, um, and they've got a exclusive arrangement with a group in the US, which is probably the world's, one of the world's largest drone manufacturers called Air and Environment. Um, and so they exclusively resell Air and Environment drones into the Australian and New Zealand marketplace. Um, so that's that's where they've built their business to date. And what they've been doing is actually pouring a lot of money back into research and development, um, some key engineering and um, processes around some, ma particularly manufacturing. And we feel that they're on the cusp of actually starting to commercialize some of those new technologies that they've built out over the last few years. And yeah, maybe if we just focus on do those new technologies, it's primarily, correct me if I'm wrong, around um, body armor for um, defense forces, police forces, uh, helmets, uh, Kevlar style helmets, uh, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So um, our understanding from sort of doing some work and talking to particular people in the marketplace is that they have a, a helmet that is the only helmet in the marketplace that's not titanium that can actually stop an AK-47 round um, of sort of um, killing the, the soldiers. Yeah. Okay, cool. And- so Yeah, so they've, got, they've got a really unique process around um, under really high heat and under really high pressure, um, they can produce, um, a, a uniform um, sort of helmet shell um, where the when when the bullet actually hits the helmet shell it actually disperses um, that sort of kinetic energy across and okay yeah. cool and then They've recently, the, I mean, the, as you said, have been pouring a lot of money into this R and D to, I guess, get to this like kind of manufacturing phase. And now it's about um, rolling out and actually distributing the the product themselves. Um, and as you said, they were previously a reseller, and I know recently they've done an, an acquisition in the US to kind of um, give them that distribution footprint. So kind of going from a distributor to buying a distributor to distribute their, their own products. Um, I mean, is the US the, the, really the, the key market for them? Or, you know, is, is Australia, New Zealand also a pretty attractive market for these products? Oh, I think US is sort of the, the key global market when you're talking about defense. Um, but I know that the guys are from XTech of, you know, when you're talking about defense, you're talking about long sales cycles, particularly at that higher level of defense. Um, and I know that they've had sort of ongoing discussions with a number of um, defense groups across Europe, across the US, um, across Asia, and across Australia and New Zealand. So it's, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very long sales cycle at that high level, larger defense level. Um, but we feel that the acquisition they made in the US was actually quite complementary in terms of the, the sales cycles a lot shorter. So when you think about 
the defence sector in the US, it's not just at a Marine Corps and Army or Navy level. It's, you know, you've got a lot of these smaller counties, you've got the FBI, the states, the police forces, and those guys generally sort of order, you know, 100, 200, 300 plates, um, and they do it more frequently. So the Highcom acquisition, which is um, the business they acquired in the US, you know, that, that was a business that they bought on a really attractive multiple. I think it was around 2.6 times EBITDA. Um, but that basically gave XTech, in our view, some really key things as a part of their business. And that was um, the, the, the clearances that they needed, the sort of defence clearances to actually sell into that marketplace. Um, they had existing uh, distribution channels and relationships um, into all of those counties and state police and FBI, et cetera. Um, and that's a really sort of, you know, we think there's quite a bit of value to that sort of distribution and relationship channel that they've got. And um, yeah, it's complimentary because whilst XTech were able to have, because they have the IP around the, the highly specialized um, helmet and body armor technology that they have, they could still have those relationships at a defense level, but then Highcom actually allows them to scale that business model also through the shorter sales cycle, um, being these smaller defense groups in the US as well. So, mm. And I know XTech have done some work with the Australian Defense Forces, um, you know, which obviously gives them uh, a good reference customer when they're talking to the to the big US guys. But I think, as you say, you know, the, the, at that high level of defense, it's it's a long sales cycle, very long, you know, years in some cases. Um, but on the flip side of that, if you can get in there, you know, they're generally very good payers because they're the customer uh, of, of, you know, of note and you know tend to be also very long contracts on the end so i mean yeah. i guess if you if you stab away ahead you, you do get rewarded uh, in the end um yeah and i think so, just the key thing for me with xtech was that um you know a, a lot of they, they spend an immense amount of money millions of dollars on a, on a soldier uh in the us and so you know the key thing is protecting the soldier's life and and if you look at the, the, the sort of death rates in, in the soldiers, particularly where they've sort of fought the traditional battles, a lot of them have been, um, you know, rifle and sort of AK-47 um, deaths related to being hit in the head. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I think this is, and then and this is how XTEC was able to actually sort of start building some of their relationships um, over the past few years. And that is that, the US were out there looking for a helmet that's fitted this particular criteria. No one else in the marketplace could actually fit that criteria. And, um, uh, you know, given the amount of money that's spent on fitting out these soldiers, the helmet shell is, is an absolute critical piece. Um, and, and we feel that like, uh, you know, it's a matter of time before they start rolling it out at, at, at sort of commercial scales in, in that in those armies and market segments. So, so what's kind of the key things you're watching for? I guess over the next kind of twelve months, if we say the balance uh, uh, of FY twenty one, is it you know smaller? You know whether it's state police, you know uh, bigger um, city the police departments in the US, uh, you know placing in small orders uh, while waiting for, you know, a bigger, more uh, substantial contract to come from, uh, you know, um, a, a major kind of uh, arm of the US Defence Forces? Yeah, I think, and this is the problem where probably there's a bit of a disconnect, we believe, where the current share price of XTEC is and where we think it's heading, is that Traditionally, the XTEC business has been quite boring. Um, it's a reseller business. It's been mm. low, low margins. It's built its name and reputation up on, you know, basic reselling of products. But what they have done, and, you know, we've been down to Canberra, we've been down to the Adelaide facility, um, inspect those. Um, you know, we feel like they're set up now and they're at the point in terms of some of the conversations that they're having 
to move and make the switch to a lot higher margin internal technologies that they've got and to start commercializing those. And, that, and that's, there's a few things that they've got outside of obviously the helmet and body armor stuff that we've touched on. Um, but underlying all that, there's a quality business. There's a quality business in the US um, that continues to do very well. There's a quality business in Australia and New Zealand where the thematic continues to do well. So in terms of our thesis, we're like, well, you know, there's fair or slightly below fair value for what we think is currently there today in the business. And if they do execute out on a number of these different technology verticals and start commercializing that, we think there's extremely significant upside um, to those. And, and they've got a few technology pieces. One is the, the helmets and body armor. They've got a Im imaging software mapping technology, um, which they're actually rolling out with uh, EOS at the moment, which it, absolutely incredible technology stack. So that they're actually flying drones um, and then sending real time information back down to unmanned um, vehicles um, that obviously EOS are very well known for. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually have a sort of an end to end kill um, sort of circle um, without any sort of human intervention involved in that. So, and, you know, we think that's where sort of modern warfare is, is, is heading. So um, yeah, some pretty, pretty incredible technologies. Yeah. So it sounds, yeah, it's a, a overall, it sounds like a, a business that's in, in transition from, uh, as you say, a reseller distribution, low margin business to a more kind of high tech, high margin, high proprietary uh, technology style business that maybe um, the market isn't fully appreciating yet. Um, yeah. I just want to uh, let, let's jump on to the on to the second one. We're completely uh, sure. switching sectors here to go to uh, Swick Mining. Look, uh, I, we, we spoke off air before we started, you know, Swick Mining won't be a name that's unfamiliar to anybody uh, who's followed, you know, Australian microcaps for the last uh, decade or so. I mean, generally, you know, uh, owned by, uh, you know, the Swick family predominantly, pretty well-run business, but maybe like exec boring, you know, they're very dependent on um, where the mining cycle is specifically, um, probably a bit more geared to the exploration side rather than the than the production side. Um, but that might have changed since the last time I had a deep dive on it. Um, but I know they have been investing a lot of money in R&D, but like XTech uh, for the last couple of years. And from what I've seen, maybe that's starting to finally uh, bubble to the surface. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that. Um as you said, we, we feel like it's an extremely well-run um, underground, predominantly underground drilling business. Uh, it's got a great balance sheet. The underlying earnings in that business uh, are very strong. Um, you, you know, you've had a, a huge amount of money that's been um, raised in the resources space. Uh, and that's contributed to sort of large amounts of drilling that's going to be ongoing for the next 18, 24 months. And that's been reflected in the, the order book for SWIC as well. So you've got you've got really stable revenues. You've you've got some great tier one mining clients globally. Um, you know they're probably one of the leading drill drillers globally in that underground mining space, um, where there's probably slightly better margins and, and a bit more uh, moat around around the business. Um, when we invest in companies, we're really focused on on catalysts that are going to drive the revaluation for the for the share price. Mm -hmm. And for us, um, in the last couple of weeks, SWIC have actually come out and they're fully committed to a demerger of the R&D business that they've probably spent close to $25 million over the last few years building out. And that's a real-time assay business called Orexplore. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, SWIC came out and actually appointed a, a new managing director for that business, um, the old CEO for, for, for Spookfish. Um, so, so they've built a great team around that new business. They, we're pretty confident um, that they're committed to doing a demerger of that business. Um, and yeah, you know, I think what has been uh, an issue for a lot of the existing investors in the Swick business is that that Aura Explore has actually sucked a lot of the cash flows out. Um, it's been highly capital intensive. 
it's taken probably a lot longer than was anticipated and you're stuck with um, this business that's doing great free cash flows. Um, it's well run. It's a, it's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty boring sort of um, drilling business. And then you've got this incredible technology stack that's taken a long time to build. And so we think by demerging both of those businesses, um, you're going to attract two different um, investor groups. Um, you know, with we think the drilling business will provide um, the share existing shareholders with some some really high quality dividends, a, a great dividend stream um, that'll continue to operate as it has been. And then you've got access to this um, technology stack with a great board management that can actually um, continue to grow out its client base and, and grow that business. And they've already got one commercial contract in place with St. Barbara. Um, and we feel like their their pipeline's pretty strong. And given the relationship that Swick obviously has with a couple of large mining cl clients globally, then um, you know we think they're well placed to continue growing. Um, and have the have the board set out a a, a timeline for the demerger, or is that still a, a process that's ongoing? Um, as you said, they've appointed a new CEO. I saw. Um, the announcement yesterday, I mean, you know, a highly credentialed CEO, definitely capable of, you know, managing a demerger and running a, a you know, a listed company um, uh, in his own right, uh, no doubt. Um, but have they come out with any kind of timeline? Is this something we should expect over, over the next 12 months or is it going to take a bit longer to kind of untangle it from the, the existing kind of drilling business? Yeah, I think... I mean, in that presentation they released the other day, there's quite a bit of information there. I mean, there's comfort that the board's fully committed to the demerger now. I think that was one of the, the key risks. I think that's been alleviated. Um, I believe they're coming out at the AGM with the timeline and, and some more detail around that. Um, so we'll just have to wait until November for that. Um, but but I, I'm of the view that, um, you know, they're sort of, Full steam ahead. It's it's um, now getting the sort of proper approvals and um, getting the right valuations, and um, that'll, in our view, that'll probably happen sort of first second quarter of, of next year. Yeah, and uh, your view, you know, let's let's say we're sitting here March next year, just uh, and you know it's all gone through, or you know we're just starting out the formalities. Um, would you want to own? The mining business post, given you know the, the cash flow drain that's not going to be there anymore, because uh, it sounds like even though the technology is done, you know it's still going to require kind of growth capital, you know, to kind of get it to cash flow break even until they until they get the orders going. Or do you want to be in the you know the the technology business that's got a you know kind of maybe a very high growth profile in front of it, um, or do you not want to be in either? <laughs> you don't have to choose. Oh, well, I think the, the, the Oryx Bore business is extremely exciting to us. We think there's enormous scale to that business. It makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, without going into too much details, we feel like that um, the granular detail that the Oryx Bore machine is able to sort of, inf the information it's able to push out and to clients is extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's a business we, Given currently buying SWIC shares today, we feel you're getting a free call option into that business. Um, with SWIC trading at sort of two times EBITDA um, or two times underlying EBITDA, then you know we think that's a very reasonable valuation. And we, we actually feel that if you if you demerge the the technology business, um, it wouldn't, and they start paying a um, a quality dividend out of that drilling business. Then it so actually have a long history of yeah yeah so i think it actually becomes really attractive to some other shareholders who are just looking there for a boring business that want an income stream mm. so um you know if you actually demerge it there's there's a strong argument that you might actually get an increase in the in that existing yeah. swick 
switch. You know what I mean? Yeah, because you got two kind of, you know, from a sector play as well. You know, if somebody's looking for uh, a mining exposure, uh, you know, right now it's a bit complicated for them because there's this technology business wrapped up in it. And on the flip side, it's the same for somebody who's, you know, looking at high growth technology companies. It's, you know, it's got this mining services businesses wrapped up around it. Um, so, yeah, it can be, yeah. quite, you know, it's it's tricky for someone to allocate capital because it, they, they, they don't know kind of which sector it's going to fall into. Um, yeah, and there's probably you know there's probably good reason why the shares traded down. I mean, if you've been in that story for a number of years and you've been there for a quality mining drilling business and you haven't really been getting any net profit out of that business, mm. and it's taken a lot longer and a lot more money to build out this ore export business, you you know you'd probably be pretty frustrated. So, um, and just on the ore explorer, I, I know I'm sick. You know, traditionally as I said you know probably been more exposed to the exploration end of the of the mining cycle rather than the production end where does or explore sit does it still say hit that exploration end or you know can it equally be valuable to you know the the, the explorer end of the market and the production end of the market does it you know does it go right across the kind of i guess mining cycle profile yeah i, I my understanding is that it's it's valuable at both. Um, obviously, you know, exploration is a pretty obvious one given that, mm. you know, you can get. And the really reason why we really like it is that it's actually taken a, while, a bit longer because you actually need to build the ore explore into the actual workflow and processes for these larger groups. So, um, you know, that's for, for large organizations, that's, that always takes longer. Um, but as a result, you actually end up with a with a a very sticky product and and revenue um, that comes out of the ore explore. So um, you know, obviously, exploration it, it'll give you sort of real time analysis before you move the drill rig on. Mm. You might have missed you know 100 grams per ton, 20 meters at 100 grams per ton, or something like that. Mm. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, for, for the production side as well, it's, it's just from talking from with a few guys in that industry, um, it's it's very helpful for them as well in terms of where they need to drill. Um, yeah, I think in uh, mine engineers in terms of um, drilling programs, blasting programs, you know, where I guess where to kind of focus your bang for book, um, even within a fairly well defined ore body. Um, it can, I guess, optimize your 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 drilling and blasting program. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Dave. Listen, I think we're just about out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the insights on the on the two companies. We definitely uh, keep an eye on both of them. And yeah, that was the first in our series. Hopefully, we'll have a few other managers on here talking uh, their own book and, and 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 two interesting stocks next month. Uh, until then, um, I'll speak to you again. Thanks.